Howdy folks, in this lesson of the CompTIA Network Plus course, we'll be covering the topic of the CIA triad. What exactly is it and how does it work? Right, before we jump into it though, help your homie out by giving this video a like and then obviously for you yourself, if you'd like to know when more of these lessons go live, remember to subscribe, otherwise you might miss it. All right, let's get down to business. The CIA triad. First of all, folks, when we say CIA here, this is not to be confused with the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States, which is also known as CIA for short. If you're from the United States, you'll probably know that there is a federal Central Intelligence Agency there known as CIA. In IT, however, in this lesson, when we say CIA, we in fact mean something entirely different. CIA in IT is also an abbreviation, like you'd expect. When we talk about CIA triad in IT, it is normally a triangle of sorts we refer to. The triangle is to help folks understand how this works. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and add a triangle here on the screen for you guys to help with this explanation. This triangle on the screen is going to be our CIA triangle, which we'll use to explain the CIA triad. You'll see in a few moments I'm going to be adding words to the three sides of this triangle and that's basically what all of this is about. So let's get back to that abbreviation. What does CIA in IT stand for? The C in CIA is short for confidentiality. You can see I also added to the triangle for you folks. The I in CIA is for integrity. And then lastly, the A is for availability. So there you have it. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, like we said earlier, the CIA in IT is often confused with the CIA in the United States. So to help with that, the CIA in IT is often referred to as AIC instead. Basically the same letters, but well, just backwards. All right, so now we know what the CIA abbreviation IT stands for. But what does it actually do in all of that? Let's start with the confidentiality side of the triangle. I'm sure that when I say the word confidential or confidentiality, a lot of you already have a pretty good idea what that is in general. In IT, usually it boils down to information that is private and that is also going to remain private or it needs to remain private for whatever reason. This can apply in various situations, like when data information is stored, it can apply when data information is transferred, the information or data itself can also be pretty much, well, anything of value, I suppose. The point here is, it's something sensitive, usually, that is going to be for certain people's eyes only. Usually only authorized people in most cases. Well, their eyes at least in most cases. This could be something as simple as your income slip, if you get that kind of thing from your employer that shows how much you've been paid. Um, that is obviously something very personal. It is something very confidential and it's for your eyes and your employer's eyes only. So now we know with confidentiality, information does not get disclosed to any unauthorized people or machines. Only the people that need to see it or access it can see it and access it. And when it comes to actually providing confidentiality, how can we achieve this with information? There are actually many ways you can get confidentiality of information, but I'll list three main ones for you folks that you need to be aware of if you're going to be attempting the official CompTIA Network Plus exam associated with this course. The first is encryption. Encryption itself can even be used in many ways, but that's besides the point right now. So encryption for the folks that don't know this already basically converts the information into jibber jabber. Only the people that is actually allowed to access the information will be able to using something like a password or a key of sorts and it can be many things. If anyone else besides the authorized people try to access the information, they will just see all kinds of useless jibber jabber, which they can't do anything with. This is a very effective way of ensuring security and confidentiality with information. The second method you folks need to know is access controls. If I just say access controls, it sounds complicated, but I'm using those words because that's the words you need to know 
for your exam. What is access controls though, you ask? Well, it can be a lot of things, but a simple example, this would be things like basic read and write permissions, NTFS permissions, shared permissions, that kinds of stuff. So if I, for example, have something on my computer or on my server, um, I can go and choose who can access it over the network using these permissions we spoke of. And I can also go and choose what they can do if they're allowed to access it. I can go and configure permissions that, for example, only allows them to view the contents. I can go and configure it to allow them to view it and also to go and change it and delete it. But if I only configure them to view the contents, you would notice they normally can't go and delete it. They can't go and change it. They can't go and make anything new. They can just go and view the contents. In other words, read permissions. If they can go and change it and delete it and make new stuff, that's read write permissions in most cases. So that's pretty much what it comes down to in a nutshell when we say access controls. The third method you folks need to know for ensuring confidentiality is actually a way less common one. That will be stenography. Not sure if I'm even pronouncing that correctly, but I have it written on the screen there for you guys. Would you believe me if I told you I'm actually not English? <laughs> Some might have guessed that by my accent. At least I'm assuming so. Anywho, let's move on. So what is that fancy complicated word that I probably can't even pronounce correctly? By the way, let me know in the comments um, down below if I pronounce that word correctly. It's when you or someone hides information in something like an image. A picture, in other words. Sounds like something out of a science fiction movie or something like out of a national treasure movie. If any of you guys have ever watched that, <laughs> I love those movies. I assure you, though, it is real. You can hide stuff within pictures and heck, you can even hide stuff in videos, believe it or not. That's how some people get the devices infected with malware. They go onto not so legal websites to go and download not so legal movies and series. And when they do that, they sometimes get the devices infected with malware because those videos contained hidden malware in them. It's both cool and scary at the same time. So, but when it comes to security, you know, from our perspective here, you can go and use these pictures, if it's a picture, to go and hide information. And the person on the other side can just go and retrieve the information from that picture. Sounds like something from a movie, like we said. All right, and that's pretty much the confidentiality explained in a nutshell. Let's look at the integrity, which was one of the other free sides in that triangle. Now, folks, don't confuse this topic with when someone says, a person has integrity. That is a different kind. <laughs> in this instance, when we say the word integrity, we mean data has not been changed or tampered with. So integrity is a way of ensuring that information has not been changed by someone or something and that it's still in its original condition. Examples would be something like a contract or other electronic form of something important. If me and you guys were, for example, to sign a contract, we can use some sort of security to ensure that that document does not get tampered with. If someone does end up trying to fiddle with it or try changing something in this document, we would know. We would know that someone has changed something or that someone has tampered with this document. Integrity can also be used for some other things like making sure something is really coming from the source where it's claiming to come from. Something like an email would be a good example of that. So when someone sends you an email, how do you know it's really coming from the person or the place that is sending it? It is surprisingly very easy to go and forge an email address, which is also called spoofing, just so by the by. And once that happens, you won't know whether this email is actually coming from the person or the company or if it's not. It's a real tricky situation. There are, however, luckily many security measures these days that can detect spoofing and other things like spoofing. Now, coming at this from an integrity point of view, how do we ensure that that email really is from who it claims to be? That's where this integrity once again comes into play. So knowing now what we do, we can say integrity ensures data is stored or transferred as intended. So just like before with the confidentiality topic, there are many ways of achieving this, but there are about three main methods you need to be aware of if you intend on writing this exam. The first method is something called hashing. You can think of hashing as a fingerprint of the data or 
you can think of it as taking a photo of the data. If someone changes the data, the unique fingerprint, or should I say hash, will look different than the one in the beginning. If it looks different than the original hash or the original fingerprint, then you'll know, okay, this is not the original. If you or me were to take a photo of the information way in the beginning, and then later on, once we look at the information again, and the information looks different than that photo we took in the beginning, then once again, okay, cool, then we know. No longer the original, something has changed, someone has tampered with it. A second method of ensuring integrity that you folks need to know is digital signatures. Now, just like with physical papers, where you can go and sign on them with a hand signature, and if your signature is missing on them, we know it's not authentic or the original, the same principle applies digitally. The digital signatures built on the hashing we just spoke of by encrypting that hash with a private key. This allows the person receiving the information to both confirm that the information is coming from the true source, but also that the information has not been changed. Two birds with one stone, as the saying goes. A third method of ensuring integrity that I'd like you folks to know about is certificates. No, we're not talking about the kind you get when you earn a certification or a qualification, nor are we talking about the kind you would get if you do something like winning an Olympics competition. Not those kinds. These certificates I'm talking about is used to ensure the integrity of things like service or data. It's a means of making sure the server you or the users connect to is the right one, the legit one and not some fake wannabe server pretending to be another. All right, and that, folks, pretty much summarizes the integrity part of that triangle, which leaves us with the last corner being the availability side. Availability is making sure your systems and services are up and running and that the information is easily accessible to those that need to access it and that need to use it. It doesn't help anyone much if you have all kinds of cool and fancy security in place, but now the users that actually need to access the information, they also can't access it, or they have great difficulty accessing it. You need to make sure the information that is now secure is also very easily accessible and usable by those authorized to access it and use it. So with that in mind, we can say authorized users need to be able to access information quickly and easily. Availability is not just that though. It's not just making sure information is easily accessible to those that need to access it. It is also making sure that it's always accessible, no matter what. What I mean by this is, imagine having a lot of information on a server and then having that server fail on you in one way or another. Now that's the exact opposite of availability. The idea here is, should something like a server fail, obviously it's not limited to service, there should be no difference to the user who is accessing this information. There are many things we can do to achieve this goal. One would be to add two or more of everything. Making sure you have two servers, two identical servers in other words, making sure you have two network interface cards inside each of these servers in case one of them fails, making sure you have two network switches everywhere where possible, making sure you have a backup internet connection if applicable, that kinds of stuff. Availability can also be achieved by adding other things like a UPS, uninterruptible power supply for those of you that don't know what the abbreviation means. It could be adding a power generator in the event of a power failure, so these are all examples of achieving that goal of availability. So availability is making sure you have high availability, redundancy, and fault tolerance. For those that don't know what redundancy and fault tolerance is, they are very much the same, but one can be seen as a cold or warm standby, where the other can be seen as a hot standby. So redundancy is basically having a spare of something on hand nearby, so that if something like a network switch fails, not limited switches, you can just go and disconnect the failed switch and just go and plug in a new spare one that you have on site and you'll be back up and running in little to no time. 
this would be referred to as a cold or a warm standby depending on what exactly we're talking about and how quickly you can be back up and running again a hot standby which is now fault tolerance is when a service or a system doesn't go off at all or only goes off for like a fraction of a second or so an example would be when you have a backup server or firewall or something already idling in the background and as soon as the main one fails, the main server, the main firewall or the main whatever fails, the backup one pretty much kicks in either instantaneously or nearly instantaneously. That is an example of fault tolerance. So it's a little bit quicker is what it is. All right, folks, I hope you've learned something today. Please smash that like button and remember to also subscribe. I'd also like to thank the sponsors and supporters of this channel. Thank you very much to every one of you folks. If you yourself would also like to support the channel, um, you can find all that information in the video description down below, like usual. Alternatively, you can just go and hit that thanks button below the video. All right then, I'll meet you guys in lesson 20 of the CompTIA Netto Plus course.